I'm so glad to be back in San Francisco. I, I think there are a few places in the world where I would be uh, introduced into a Japanese-founded uh, workshop hacker space, gathering people talking about Bitcoin development and Bitcoin scripting with the phrase, I will sprinkle some lube on you. <laughs> Damn, I love this place. Go San Francisco. <laughs> All right, so um, today's talk is different from some of the other talks I've done. So bear with me. We're going to do this uh, kind of slowly and uh, in a very casual manner. This is not uh, one of my usual talks where I'm going to tell you about big picture vision and stuff like that. What I want to do is talk about some interesting features of Bitcoin Script and explain them. So first question is. How many of the people here are developers, or have at least coded once or twice? Okay. And how many people are completely unfamiliar with Bitcoin Script? Honest now. <laughs> All right. Okay. So I'm going to do a very quick introduction to some of the fundamentals of Bitcoin Script, and then we're going to dive into some more advanced topics around conditionals and flow control and guard clauses, time locks, all the way up to if we get to it, um, some of the scripts you see in Lightning. And I'm going to lose some of you on the way there, um, but that's okay because hopefully you can watch the video or read the chapters and kind of catch up. So how many people did the homework? <laughs> so, um, part of what I'm going to be talking about is some of the new content from the second edition of Mastering Bitcoin. As you probably know, that book, as with the first edition, was written on GitHub in public, all the laundry out in public, everything for everyone to see and criticize. And notice all of the horrific mistakes I made, and hopefully do pull requests before it goes into final production, which is next week. Hint, hint. Um, I will also be saying some things here tonight that are wrong. Um, extra points if one you notice, um, and two you send me a message afterwards and help me fix them in the book. Uh, if I do say things here that are wrong, it's because I don't know they're wrong, which is why I need your help. If you do know they're wrong, that's really what I could use. Um, so, no promises any of this is going to work or that it is correct, but it will give you some greater insights into how Bitcoin Script works. So, let's get started. I'm going to use the whiteboard mostly. Uh, Bitcoin Script is a fourth-like stack-based language that uses a reverse Polish notation. How many people did I lose <laughs> so far? Okay, a few. Uh, and what that means is that it uses as its fundamental elements a stack, and the stack evaluates functions or script operands in the opposite order than you would expect. And the parameters of functions or operators come before the operators themselves. So, an example of a reverse Polish notation script is: let's say you want to do one plus one. Okay, start with the easy stuff. How do you write that? It's one, one, plus. And the reason it's like that is because this gets evaluated through a stack. A stack is a data structure where you push things into the stack or you pop things from the stack. Uh, think of a stack of dishes, right? You can only access the topmost dish. In order to get the one below it, you have to pop off the top one, and then you get to the second one. Right? So if you want to evaluate this, and I'll use this notation, which is the one I use in my book. So let's say this is the stack. Right? So the system will start by evaluating the first item in the script. And if it's just a number, it gets pushed onto the stack. So the one goes here. The script pointer moves to the next item. Goes here. Got another one. Push that onto the stack. Great. 
And now we've got one item on the stack, which is the plus operator. Now, when you get to an operator, usually an operator takes a few parameters. The plus operator takes two parameters, the two things it's adding together. Where does it find those two parameters? It pops two items off the stack. So a plus operator is defined as an operator that pops two items off a stack, adds them together, and pushes the result back onto the stack. Right? So, pop, pop, add, push. Pop, pop, add them together, and push the result onto the stack. And the program terminates. That's how you do one plus one is two. It's a bit weird, right? Okay? Now, in Bitcoin, the uh, scripting language works like this. We often use the prefix op to denote operators. So, in Bitcoin script, this would look like op one, op one, op at, and. Op1 just pushes one to the stack, and op1 pushes one to the stack, and op add pops two items, adds them together, and pushes the result onto the stack. The end result is two. Same thing, right? For the rest of these examples, I will not use the op prefix. It's implied. The only reason the op prefix exists there is because in the actual code that implements Bitcoin, for example, Bitcoin Core or Bitcoin or the Bitcoin. The variables that are used to denote these operators are written with the prefix op. Many programming languages actually don't allow you to start a variable with a number. Um, they require the first part of a variable name to be a letter. So hence prefix op underscore whatever. Right? But it's redundant. Everything has op underscore in front of it, so we just drop it from everything and we continue this conversation. So far so good. Who's with me? Yay! Very good. Okay. Who's familiar with a pay-to-public key hash script? I'm going to run through an execution of that very, very quickly. Are you safe from it? Has seen it run or understands how it's executed? Has heard of it? Is vaguely aware that some such thing exists. <coughs> okay, so when in Bitcoin you create a transaction that says Alice pays Bob one Bitcoin for a cup of coffee, in the Bitcoin transaction what you get instead is a bunch of Alice's inputs with some signatures to an output that identifies Bob's address as the destination payee. Right? Maybe some change as well. Let's ignore that for now. And how does it identify Bob's address? With a script format called pay to public key hash. P2PKH. Okay? And the way that looks on the stack is It looks, I'm going to move it all along as I go through it. So it looks like dup, which stands for duplicate, hash 160, Bob's public key hash, equal checksync. Not strictly necessary to do all of this. Um, there are reasons why it's done in this particular way. Some of the first transactions, if you look at the Coinbase, for example, of the first several hundred blocks. The Coinbase is not paid like this. It's paid simply with a public key checksec. Right? Problem with a public key checksec format? If you just use the last part, you just put Bob's public key checksec, is that you've revealed Bob's public key in the output before Bob has had a chance to reveal it, to redeem it. That's dangerous. If there's ever a problem with elliptic curve. 
And you can take a public key and reverse it back to a private key, say quantum computing. Maybe you don't want all the public keys to be known. This format actually preserves it behind a double hash, which is a hell of a lot harder to break. Okay? So you've got two layers of obfuscation there. There's other reasons why you would use a hash as well. We'll see that in a bit. But this is the script. So every time you do a Bitcoin transaction, if we all pull out our Bitcoin wallets and our smartphones right now, we start sending stuff to each other's QR codes and sending transactions. You're going to be creating a bunch of transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain that will all have this script, which is called P2PKH. They will all have this script in the output. All right. How do you redeem this script? So you pr you provide two parameters to this. Let's say you're Bob. You want to spend this. You put Bob Sig and Bob Hub Key. Right. So when you put these two things, they actually get executed in sequence before this is verified. So let's say I'm Bob. I want to spend this. This is the signature I'm going to provide. This goes in the script sig. So I want to spend this. Here is my signature. It will be two parts: signature and your public key. And then you put that in the transaction you want to spend, and then the system evaluates: Is Bob really authorized to spend this particular output? How do we know? Well, let's run this through the scripting language first, and then let's run that through the scripting language. And if the final outcome is true, done. You get the Bitcoin. If it's false or anything else, <coughs> invalid transaction. Good? Everybody with me so far? Great. What happens when you evaluate these two things through the scripting language? These things are numbers. They get pushed onto the stack. So Bob Sig goes to the bottom, and Bob Pupke goes above it. And this is the state of the stack when the locking script is evaluated. So a locking script has been pushed onto the stack. Locking script is in the script execution engine. And now we start running to see if this is a valid signer for this output. If Bob is in fact allowed to spend this. Who wants to try running this? Anyone? Anyone at all wants to try a P2? Don't be shy. P2PKH. Yes, sir. Very good. You're going to pop off public, uh, Bob's pub key and duplicate. So first stack. The first script execution item we have is dupe, or also op underscore dupe. I'm taking out the ops, right? So op dupe. Okay, what does that do? It takes how many parameters off the stack? One. One. It pops one parameter off the stack. And what does it do? Duplicates it. It duplicates it, and then it pushes two parameters back onto the stack. Yes. So far, so good. Great. So we run dupe. Bob's pub key gets popped off the stack and then gets pushed back on the stack twice. I'd erase the bottom one and write both of them again. But I'm lazy and you know what I'm talking about. So now you've got two copies of Bob's public key on the stack, and we move to the next item in the script execution. And who wants to run the next one? Anybody? Yes. Well, the, the execution pointer goes to hash 160. Very good. Execution pointer is here. And I'm guessing it takes one input and produces one output. Takes one input, produces one output. Great. So the first input it takes is Bob uh, Pop Key. Bob Pop Key. And what does it do to it? It uh, pops it. It pops it. Very good. And then it so pop. Does the hash 160 operation? And it does the hash 160 operation. Who wants to tell me what the hash 160 operation is? It's actually two hashes in one. It's a SHA-256 wrapped in a RIPE-MD-160. It's a double hash. It is, in fact, the same hashing operation that goes into constructing a Bitcoin address, also known as a 
public key hash. So hash 160 took Bob's public key, hashes it through 256, SHA 256, hashes it through RIPEMD 160, and produces a 160 bit public key hash that as a result. That gets pushed back onto the stack. Let's call that Bob's public key hash. Bob PKH. Now, at this point, if all has gone well, if Bob's public key was in fact the one that Alice was paying, these two should be the same. So let's move to the next point in the stack. This is gone. This is now in the script execution. Execution pointer goes here. First thing on the, on the script execution, it's a number. What do we do with numbers? We push them on the stack. I'll just move these things up. Very good. Who wants to take equal? That's an easy one. Come on. Yes? Pop both those off. So equal takes two parameters. It pops those from the stack. Mm -hmm. Now Bob PKH, Bob PKH, two copies of the same thing. It checks if they're equal. And yes? Pushes the result back on. Very good. Okay. Next up. Yes? So check save, the pointer will move to check save. Yep. Which will take one parameter. Two. Two parameters. True and Bob. Well, actually, sorry. Um, I may have this wrong. Who can help me out here? It's equal verify. Very good. So this isn't equal. It's equal verify. Why is it equal verify? What's the difference between equal and equal verify? And if it's true, it doesn't push this on. Let's carry on. Check sig. Check sig pops these two items off the stack, and it says, "Is this a signature for this public key?" And the way it does that is using the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm to do a signature verification against the public key. Now, here's an interesting thing. And this is really important to realize. How does it know what's being signed? Is there some implicit data thing? There is some implicit data. So I've written a simplification of what's happening here. Checksig actually takes more than these parameters. First of all, Bob's signature consists of three parts. It consists of an R value an S value, and a sig hash type. A sig hash type may be sig hash all, sig hash single, sig hash only, whatever. One of those sig hash types. And what does the sig hash type do? It tells checksig, there is a transaction also in your data space. You take that transaction, and if it's sig hash all, you create a hash based on a very specific recipe by mixing together all of the inputs and all of the outputs. If it's sig hash single, then it says you create a hash for this input and this output only. Right? So in here, implicit is something that tells checksig which part of the transactions it's going to fingerprint, so it can check the signature against the public key against that specific hash. So what's being signed is the hash, and how you construct that hash depends on whether this is a sig hash all or some other type of signature. Have I lost the rest of the room? Slowly? All right.
address? Why was it called the hash 160? Um, because 160 is the RIPE MD 160, which produces the 160 bits, which is the final hash you apply. So the output of hash 160 is the output of RIPE MD, but it also internally does a SHA-256. All good? What's up? Oh, very good. Thank you. All right, so is everybody with me so far? Okay, now we've demonstrated, I've demonstrated poorly, but to, to a level that maybe you understood a bit, how the script is executed on the stack by pushing things. You notice they go in reverse order, right? The first thing that gets pushed is the last thing that comes off, right? So when you have a function in a script, it acts on the things that are closest to it, because those get pushed onto the stack last. And then later things in the script act on parts of the script that are furthest from it, because those are the first things that get pushed on the stack. Right? So first you move the parameters in, do something with them, create new parameters, do something with them, create new parameters, do something with them, and then there may be some leftovers at the bottom that get picked up at the end. Yeah? That's a common thing. So when you're looking at a script, it's not always easy when you look at it to figure out which part is acting on which other parts of data, because you have to visualize the sequence of pushing things and popping things onto and off of the stack, and it depends on how many parameters are being pushed and popped by each of the intermediate commands. Everyone with me so far? Great. So I'm not going to draw the stack again. What I'm going to do instead is draw some scripts. One second. So um, we talked briefly about the suffix verify. Does anybody remember which of the opcodes have a suffix that can be verified? Equal. So equal comes in two forms. Next, anyone? Uh, Checksig. So again, you have Checksig. Check lock time. That only comes in one form. We'll get to that in a bit. Uh, Multisig. Check Multisig. Each of these comes in two forms, both with and without verify. So, can someone has anyone figured out exactly the difference between the two? Where would you use one? Where would you use the other? Yes. So the verify is only uh, going. It's going to. If I understand this correctly, uh, it's going to continue if there is that condition controlled. Otherwise, it is not. Correct. So verif anything that has verify will only continue execution of the script if the outcome of the conditional operator is true. In which case, it will not push that true back to the stack, and it will simply continue execution. Otherwise, equal check sig and check multisig put the outcome, true false, on the stack. And whether it's true or false, you then have to further down decide what to do with that. Maybe afterwards you could do something um, to verify that it's true. Um, but that's not really useful because you would do it right there. Um, so you could use equal, but it just be more cumbersome. You could use equal, but it could be more cumbersome. Now, um, not much point in using these at the end of a script, 
because the end of the script acts like a verify, meaning that when you reach the end of the script, if true is on the stack, you're good. The log script has been unlocked. If anything other than true is on the stack, your script terminates with a false done. That locking script has not been satisfied. So effectively, the end of the script acts as a verify, meaning that you can comfortably put equal check sig or check multisig at the end of a script because the verify is implied right afterwards. The reason you would use the equal verify, check sig verify, or check multisig verify is if you're putting it earlier in the script, you don't want to leave anything on the stack, and you want to terminate. Like this is a kill clause. You're not going to worry about whether this is true or false. If it's false, you're done. You're not going to evaluate anything else. Yes? Okay. Does anybody remember in programming what we call clauses that decide whether the following part of the language is going to be executed or not? Anybody? If clause is well, yeah, it's a very specific type of an if clause. <coughs> yes. I think they're called guard clauses. It's right? called a guard clause. So a guard clause is if the previous thing was true, then do this. So the this part only gets executed if you pass by the guard. It's a gatekeeper. It says this code only gets executed under a specific condition. Guard clauses are used extensively in programming for one simple reason. They are very easy to read and very clean. We use them in formal languages, especially languages where bugs are very dangerous. And the reason we use guard clauses is because if you wrap code in a simple guard clause, that code will not run if the guard clause is not satisfied. Right? So you see that all the time. If debug prints to log file. Right? And all you're doing is turning on or off that functionality when there's a debug. Right? Otherwise, the print to log file never happens. Um, if debug mode asserts zero, that's the guard clause that should have been in that line in Bitcoin Unlimited, but wasn't. Um, so guard clauses are useful because they simply preclude the execution of the next thing. We'll see how we use them in the next section. So there's that. There's a specific type of command that only has a verify version, and that's time locks. The two forms of script-based time locks: check lock time verify, check sequence verify. There is no check lock time without verify. There is no check sequence without verify. There is a very good reason for that. It actually makes it rather difficult to write scripts that run that are valid now, but not valid in the future. You can only write scripts that are invalid until an event, but from that point to infinity. This is deliberate. Time locks allow you to activate a transaction, but not expire it. Once something becomes valid, it is valid forever. This is consistent throughout Bitcoin. There is no such thing as a script that is valid today that is not valid tomorrow unless the consensus rules change. Right? Transactions do not expire, and scripts do not expire. And as a result, check lock time is written in such a way that you can say not if, and then run something afterwards to invert its meaning. So check lock time verify, for example, means this is valid only after block 1000. You can't invert its meaning and say this is valid only before block 1000 and not after, because the verify doesn't let you evaluate the outcome. It simply stops. Does that make sense? Yeah, you can get around that, but it's not easy. It's not easy. You have to use something called a revocation. All right, who's with me so far? Who's still having fun? <laughs> this is the geeky meetup. I love it. All right. So the verify clause at the end of an operator is a form of a conditional, right? And it's also a form of flow control. It's the same as writing if true, 
do what comes after, else return. Right? Return, the return code in Bitcoin causes the script to terminate. Right? And does not evaluate true, it evaluates false. Boom, done. If you find a return in your script and run it, right? So verify is the same as saying, if true, do this, else return. But it's a much more compact form, and we'll see how that works. Okay. So the most useful form of conditional is a flow control statement. And a flow control statement is an if then else statement. Everybody familiar with if then else? Yes? Um, in, in Silicon Valley, what we call if then else, we call it AI. <laughs> For many programmers, AI is simply a hundred thousand if then else's concatenated together that evaluate all the possible ways something might work. I wrote an interpretive, interactive psychiatrist called Eliza in college as a very weak AI that would interact and have a conversation with you, and it consisted a lot of if then else. Uh, trying to figure out what the hell you were saying in English. So, um, if then else statements. Now, this is Bitcoin, of course. So, take what you know about if then else, sprinkle some weird on it, and we get Bitcoin. If else and if. This is what it looks like in Bitcoin. So in the Bitcoin script, you have if, else, and if. All right. What is A? Anyone? A condition? You would assume so. This is where the weird comes in. Second best guess? Yes? It's the code that gets executed if what was on the stack is true. It's the code that gets executed if the condition is true. So this is the then part. You can assume that here there's a then, just to make it easier to read. If true, then A. Else B. That's how it actually runs. So you start reading Bitcoin script, you see an if, you assume the very next thing is the thing that you're testing. It is not. The very next thing is the thing you're executing, if the thing you tested was true. Then there's an else statement, or not. There might just be an end if. Then there's the thing that runs if it was false. Then is an end if. So far, so good. Where the hell is the condition? Before the if. Before the if. So actually, the way this works is it looks like this. X is the, is the condition. So the way this reads is if X, then A, else B, and if. Problem is, the X isn't in the script. The X isn't in the locking script. It almost never is. It's not as a literal for sure. There might be other stuff before there, in which case, whatever they put on the stack, maybe they put a true or false. So if you had an equal here, equal gets evaluated, it dumps true or false on the stack. If gets evaluated, it takes the true or false from the equal. So they're saying if equal, then A else B. So if this X was an equal operator, it took whatever two things were on the stack before, weighed them together. If they were equal, this part runs. If they were different, this part runs. Yes? So you could actually take an equal verify and write it as equal if what comes after, else return and if. It's a rather long-winded way of writing the same thing. But very often in scripts, there is no X. And this gets very confusing. Because you read the script and you think, well, it's just English, right? Programming is just English. <laughs> so if A is true, 
then I'm not quite sure, but else B, right? And that's not what this script does. And the first thing you come across conditional flows in Bitcoin script, your natural inclination is to read it. So you read, for example, if something check lock time verifies something check sig, and you think, oh, it's checking the check lock time. It's not. The condition came before, but it's not on the script. So where the hell is it? And why is it not on the script? Because you're doing reverse pull notation. You're doing reverse pull notation. So first, it has to get pushed, which means it comes before the function that actually uses it. Yes, but why not put it before the if right in the locking script? There's a very good reason for that. Because if the condition is in the locking script, then you put it in place when the UTXO is created, and it only ever has one value, the one you put there, and therefore the rest of the script is pointless. Because if this was something that evaluates to true and you put it in the locking script, then it will always run A. And if it was false and you put it in the locking script, it will always run B. So why the hell do you have the if there? Why don't you just get rid of all of that and just say A or B? The reason you can't put the condition in the script is because the script gets recorded on the blockchain and is immutable. And is the part that gets executed every time in exactly the same way. So whatever you put there will always evaluate to either true or false, will always run A or B. And therefore, if you put it in the locking script, you're just wasting space. Right? This is a variable. So you need to put it in the part of the scripting language that's variable, and that's the unlocking script. <coughs> Which means that the person spending provides the condition. Oh, that's weird. And so this comes to the basic understanding of what conditional flow does in Bitcoin. <clears throat> what that says is this is locked, this simple locking script, if it was exactly like this. It says this can be spent two ways. And you choose. You show up with an unlocking script that leaves true on the stack. We're going to try and spend this with method A. You show up with an unlocking script that, spend, that has false on the stack. We're going to try and spend this with script B. The unlocking script chooses one of the two paths to execute. So, if statements in Bitcoin, conditional flow in Bitcoin, is very different from how we would use a procedural language because the condition you're testing is user input. It comes from the unlocking script. So in essentially, in Bitcoin script, you're saying there are two ways to spend this UTXO, A or B. And you can choose equally between both of them by saying true or false in the spending script. Now that seems weird, because that doesn't seem very secure. What do you mean the unlocking script can choose? They can just choose A or B? Well, then we've got to see what happens here. So usually that means something sophisticated is happening here. Let's have a look. So here's a locking script. It says, well, you try reading it with English first. So it goes, if Bob's public key is check synced, then no, that's wrong. <laughs> okay. So what this says is, if you give me a true, I'm going to try and use Bob's public key to check this. If you give me a false, I'm going to try and use Alice's public key to unlock this script. Which means that to spend this. Bob passes as the unlocking script Bob Sig. True. And Alice can spend the same thing by saying
Alice Egg Falls. That's really weird. That's really weird. You probably don't understand it at first glance, but let me explain how this works. So let's say Bob presented this. So how does this execute on the script? Let's put it in our mind and think about it. So Bob Sig is the first thing. It's a number. It gets put onto the stack. Then true gets put on top of it in the stack. Then the if clause is executed. It pops off the true, drops everything else, and runs this. Now pub key goes on top of Bob Sig. Check Sig runs. Sig pub key check Sig true done. Bob spends it. Similarly, here. Alice sig goes on the stack, false goes above it. If executes, it's false. All of this goes away, the else clause runs, Alice's pub key gets pushed on the stack, check sig pops Alice's pub key and Alice sig. True, done, Alice spends this output. I just wrote a really freaky weird one of two multisig. That's a one of two multisig between Bob and Alice. It's two keys. Any one of them can spend it with a single signature. Right? So what I did was multisig, but with an if clause. And all they have to do in order to choose the right clause for their particular execution path, the one they want that will achieve the result they want, is put a true or false at the end. Yes? Everybody with me? Some people with me? Anybody with me? Very good. Okay, so now you see why the condition is actually provided by the redeemer. Now, that may be a problem. You may want to make sure that some parts of these things can only be executed by a very specific spender. Yes? Let's say we wanted to do more here. Let's say Bob had to produce a secret hash and a signature. Well, then we could do hash 160 Bob hash equal. Now Bob has to deliver three things to the stack. True, signature, and some number that when hashed produces that hash, a preimage. Yes? Not quite. We need to turn this into a guard clause. How do we turn this into a guard clause? Verify. Very good. So what we're saying now is there are two execution paths available in this script. The first execution path must first overcome this guard clause that requires a named public key to provide a signature, and then they must also provide the preimage to a hash. Alice has a lesser burden; she only needs to produce a signature. Right? Make sense? So we've piled two conditions. This is almost like a nested if, because it's a verify. Verify is the same as doing if else return. Everybody with me so far? This is getting complicated, right? And the reason for doing this would be you suspect someone has the key. Well, no. The reason for doing this is to to allow a, a mode of a mode of redemption that uses a preimage instead of a public key. Lightning uses that kind of technique for hash time locked contracts. Um, you'd actually probably put this the other way around, so that the guard clause is give me the preimage first, and then give me the signature. They're equivalent. Um, you could also have this without this. And this means Alice can spend this, or anyone with knowledge of the secret can spend this. Anyone at all. Once the secret is out, first person to get their transaction into the blockchain gets to redeem this. Yes? Yes? How long have we been going? Ten more minutes. I think I have time for one more example, which is the final example from chapter seven, which actually gives us <coughs> a 
and I want to get this right, so I'm going to write it down. All right, so at this point, this should be crystal clear. It's the same thing with a couple of little twists. And same principles of how you put things off the stack, pop things off the stack, and then evaluate them in sequence. What this is, is a partnership company that has three partners, B, C, and D. These three partners operate a multi-signature account to store the company's money. Three lawyers working together. They have a lawyer who is not part of the company, called A. And that lawyer is responsible for assisting in the case there is key loss. So if one of the partners loses the keys, the lawyer who is under contract, has a fiduciary responsibility, etc., can step in and provide a backup key. And basically what this script does is it says two out of three of the partners can spend this anytime. So the basic clause is down here which is a two of three multi-sig. Yeah? <coughs> it requires two of the three partners to sign. If they sign, it works like a normal multi-sig. Small twist, but mostly normal. Unless the output has not been spent within 30 days of being mined, if it hasn't been spent 30 days after it's mined, it can also be redeemed by a signature from the lawyer and one of the partners, not two. Or, if 90 days have elapsed, 
from the moment this output has been mined, the lawyer can spend it without any other partner signatures. Yes? So there are three execution paths. At any moment in time, all three of the execution paths can be selected. But not all of them can be run successfully, because they have guard clauses. And those dark guard clauses are based on time locks, relativistic time locks. Check sequence verify is relative to when this was mined. That's why I put the notation plus 30 days, plus 90 days. Right? That would be in seconds relative to the time it was mined. Everybody good so far? Did I make a mistake? Are the time locks according to um, box? Are they? are according to median time passed, which is a specific consensus measurement of time introduced by uh, BIP68, which introduced check sequence verify. Check sequence verify came also with BIP113 uh, when it was activated in November, I think. Um, but what, what reference is it using to? It measures the median time of the last 11 blocks, so it is permanently about an hour in the past. But because it depends on the timestamps of 11 blocks, no single miner can monkey with it. Because it, so it makes it a useful consensus rule of time. You have to adjust mentally to the fact that it will always be an hour behind, because it is looking at the median time past. 11 blocks right, is just short of two hours. And the midpoint is exactly an hour ago, right? Not wall clock time, consensus time. And because each miner can make small changes and can drift any one block by a bit, but they can't drift all eleven of the past blocks by a lot. Therefore, it's not in their hands to modify this and start sniping transactions that are not yet due under the time lock. So that's a consensus security feature that was introduced with BIP113. Questions? Lawyers B, C, and D would have to update this transaction approximately every day to prevent. Lawyers. Bingo! In order for this to be effective, you have to roll it over every 30 days, every 29 days to be precise, to prevent one of the other lawyers from colluding with the ex one of the other partners from colluding with the, with the external lawyer and taking the money, right? So they would have to sign with two out of three a transaction every 30 days and roll it back into a script like this. With the current fee structure in Bitcoin, not likely they would do that, so maybe this is as useful for now. Um, depends. Maybe they're a very rich law firm. They're moving like $10 million out of this UTXO into another UTXO, so one dollar, a five dollar fee, it's a big script, um, isn't a big deal. Um, what does the drop script do? Yes. Okay, now let's go into some of the nuances. Right? So you notice you, you get the big picture. Everybody, I think, gets the big picture, right? What this is trying to achieve. Multi-sig in the middle, very straightforward, two of three partners, a 30-day clause that allows one partner and the lawyer, and a 90-day clause, which is the they all died in the car crash together. I told them not to go in the same car. And now he's the last will executor for their last will and testament. And he's like, dearly beloved, we have gathered here to split ten million dollars. <laughs> um, so that's the final clause, right? That's the backup clause. And what we've done here is we've sequenced some events in time, and this is really important using time locks. Now I want to point out some nuances. Do you remember how I said that time locks can be activated but not expired? So they only work one way? So once something is valid, so the time lock has passed, it comes into play, but it doesn't go out of play. Right? So let me just point something out. You might at first glance think it's either or either or. Yes? But in fact, it's this and this after 30 days. And also this after 90 days, meaning that 36 days after this is mined, these guys can still do the two of three. This clause doesn't go away. This is always an option. Maybe it's A who got into a car crash, and his key disappeared. So none of the other stuff matters. 
This is always an option. Right? 92 days after this is mined, all three clauses come into play. They can, it can be redeemed in any of the three ways. Right? So the clauses come into play sequence through time, but they never expire. You can't say, and you can't redeem anymore. That is a problem or a solution. But the way it's done in uh, Lightning is using a revocation script, which you can find in Chapter 12. All right, so everybody got that part. Okay, here's a little interesting twist. You may notice this. You're like, what the hell is that doing there? There's a two. It's just hanging out. Like, ah. number two up here. Like, what is that doing up there? Anybody? You've got some ideas? Okay, let me give you some hints. Check multisig. Check multisig. Right? Takes at least three parameters. M, which is the quorum, a number of keys, minimum of one, and N, which is the how many keys are total. Right? So, check multisig. That's the N. It says there are three keys total. One key, two key, three key. Where's the M? Ah, oh, there is the M. Or one version of it. Because there is another M. Now this may start giving you a tiny bit of a glimpse of how flexible this shit is. I just took the check multisig and I spread it over two different conditional clauses, over two different flows, over two execution paths. One way of doing this is you go through this way, and then it's two key 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 three check multisig, pretty pretty much straightforward multisig, right? Or you go through this path, guard clause 30 days, and a signature from the attorney, and then one of key, 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 three, check, multisig. So then it's a one of three. So this one plays three different ways. It's a two of three, or it's a one of three. Does that make sense? That's a really powerful feature. We just leave it dangling on the stack, and then check multisig will pick it up when it's time. Yes? Is there an error? Well, I, I think technically you could say that it's a two of three or a two of four. It's a very good point. It's a two of three or a two of four because we've inserted another key up here, but it's difficult to write a two of four um, in this particular formulation. You could probably do it with by splitting the check multisig at a different part, right? Very good point. Uh, it is a 204 because we introduced this. But there are two different checks. One is it has a check sig verify, and it won't even go to the check multisig. So I see it seems more as like either it's one or three or two or three, but it never reaches the one or three. Yeah. Three so actually, it's not a 204. It's a one of one and a one of two, a uh, one of three, because two of four would imply that two of these guys could do it. Right. But it has to be this plus one of the other three. Right. Some subtle nuances there, right? Also, you start to realize that this stuff needs some debugging. Right? You really have to very carefully think about all of the scenarios, and how many keys come into play, and when they come into play, and what combinations exist, and what these people might do to collude with each other. This isn't even a Turing complete language. It's only 12 lines, and you could fit an entire DAO mess right about here. <laughs> yeah, one little bug. Oops. What do you mean A ran away with all the money? Well, you see, if this happens before this, we're fucked. <laughs> um, even within Bitcoin script, even though it's Turing incomplete, even though it's a very very simple stack based language. You can introduce quite a bit of complexity there. If you see some of the Lightning Network scripts, and you think about all of the game theoretical uh, <coughs> aspects of who can, work, who can operate at which time frame, and what can they do, it gets rather complicated to think about all the scenarios. So there are some subtleties there. 
All right, who wants to try and tell me what you have to put on the stack as the unlocking script in order to get to a two of three? We have two nested ifs, or two ifs nested. Anybody who hasn't tried so far? Come on. Yes? Two signatures and two trues. Very good. So two signatures followed by two trues. Why? First true. If we go here. Second true. If we go here. Right? Then this gets put on the stack. Everything from the else to the end if goes away. Then this gets put on the stack. Then it gets evaluated with the two signatures. Boom, boom, done. Yes? All right, great. So we, we got here and here with true, true. Um, how do we get here? True, false. True, false. false. No. Reverse Polish notation. False, true. Right? You have to put the thing that's going to be executed first last in your line. So unlocking script would be. Did I say that correct? Yes. False, true. False gets pushed on the stack. True gets pushed on the stack. True executes. False executes. You go in here. You forget the signature. And of course, the, the two signatures that are required to do that. So signature, signature, false true. Yes? Etc. Okay? Final question of the day. What the hell is that draw? Yes? Op check multisig has a bug, it pops an extra parameter. Before the first signature, you also need to put an op zero. Um, in fact, BIP one I want to say 145, I can't remember off the top of my head, actually restricts what that one thing that can be popped is down to a null dummy value. It's called the null, dam null dummy bit. It requires that the value that gets popped by check multisig is a zero. And the reason is to remove malleability. Because at the moment it pops whatever is there. So if you create a script that has zero and I change it to a script that has one, even though I don't have any of the keys, it still works because it will accept any value there. So um, I think it's pip 145 narrows that down to only zero accepted to overcome that bug. Esoteric, but very useful. Yes, there's a chapter in the book on why bugs in Bitcoin become consensus rules forever. <laughs> um, and the final thing is the drop. Anybody care to comment on why that drop is there? Yes. I guess because uh, the, the time doesn't get removed. Bingo. Every other form of verify leaves nothing behind on the stack. Check sequence verify and check lock time verify leave this value on the stack. Why? Because you might want to do more with it. For example, let's say after this we wanted to do plus another five days. Check sequence verify. So we could do five days op add op check sequence verify. So it takes the value that was left on the stack, adds five to it, or five days or whatever equivalent in seconds, runs op add, pops the two values, smushes them together, puts the sum, and that's what check sequence verify. So you can do arithmetic with this later, right? One of the exceptions to the verify rule. Now that's all good and yeah, we've got a value that's going to stay on the stack, but what if the very next thing is going to leave us some junk on the stack? We don't want that junk passing on to the next thing, so we drop it. So you'll very often see after check lock time verify and check sequence verify, you'll see a drop occur immediately after, and that's just to clean up the junk that's left over. You never get to the drop unless the time is right. Questions? So does check sequence verify a special case of this verify? Check, check sequence verify is a command that was added uh, by BIP68, which is a relative lock time. Yes, verify only 
exists as specific opcodes. You can't just slap the word verify onto something. It is a specific opcode whose name also includes verify. It's not a compound operator. It's a single operator, check sequence verify. And it doesn't exist in the other form. Yes. Yes. What happens after 29 days? What happens after? 29 days. You said you have to redo the transaction every Well, day. so if the partners don't want to ever open the door to a pub key to be able to collude with one of the partners, they better spend this within the 30-day window and create a new UTXO whose time starts again. So they have to it's a dead man switch, right? You have to restore reset the clock before it runs out, otherwise the dead man switch clause gets activated. Everybody understand what a dead man switch is? Yeah? So how can you change the meaning of a opcode with a bit without breaking the consensus? How can you change the meaning of an opcode with a bit without breaking consensus? You can do it, but only in one direction. You can only tighten the meaning of an opcode. You can take something that was valid and make it valid in fewer cases, but you can't make it valid in more. If you make it valid in fewer cases, new nodes will evaluate that and be more strict in their evaluations. All nodes will accept it because it's still valid by the old rules. That's called a soft fork. So, um, check sequence verify was actually replacing op nop seven, I want to say, or three. I can't remember. One of the nops. What does nop do? Nothing. That's why it's called nop. It's a no op, right? So if you take something that was a op and now you give it special meaning, every other old system is going to read this and it's going to go a number, a op, a drop. Eh, okay, we're so far so good, and we'll keep going. It won't enforce the meaning of lock times, but it will still evaluate the script validly, right? That's a soft fork. So old nodes don't see the additional meaning. So you can. You can tighten consensus rules by redefining something more specifically. You cannot broaden consensus rules and make previously invalid things now valid, because then the old nodes will reject it and fork themselves off the blockchain. That would be a hard fork. That would be a hard fork. Now, um, in the case of redefining the null dummy value, the bug check multisig, old nodes any value will do, including zero. New nodes only zero, and therefore there is never going to be a conflict between them. Right? If you put in one, all the new nodes are going to reject it, so they're going to enforce that consensus rule against you, but all the nodes are going to go, eh, whatever, it looks valid. Right? That's a soft fork. So all of these things have been soft forks. It appears now we can do anything with a soft fork. Uh, someone has even suggested doing a change in the 21 million coins with a soft fork. Soft forks for the win. Uh, questions. This is this is it. I'm not doing any more. So we're just going straight into Q and A. Um, Does drop take up more than one? Sorry. Does drop take up more than one. Uh, you can do two drop. Two drop is another opcode that takes two off. It's a, the double drop. Uh, I don't know if there's a three drop. I haven't looked it up. Probably, maybe. I don't know. So this stuff kind of reminds me coding in assembly. Yes, it is very similar to coding in assembly. Is there any movement towards making a compiler that could perhaps? Help? It's a no, because you can't make a compiler into a higher level language for the simple reason that because this is not Turing complete, it's missing one fundamental construct, which is there's no loop construct, there's no recursion construct either. Without a loop or recursion construct. You have a language that is not Turing complete, which means it cannot express all possible programs. If you take a higher level abstraction language, that means that many of the programs you can write in that simply do not have an equivalent in this. So, with Turing completeness, any symbolic language that is valid and consistent can be translated into any other symbolic language that is valid and consistent. That is the meaning of the Turing theorem, um, universal computing engine. Uh, this is not Turing complete, therefore you can't create a compiler. Probably a good thing, because the compiler would hide details that would end up causing you bigger problems when you compile it down to this. You'd have unanticipated consequences. Can you yes. guys wait for the mic? Oh, oh yeah, we're not picking. Yes, thank you. 
Thank you, Denise. Let's do, let's do formal Q&A now. You have to speak into a mic. Um, I hope I repeated some of the questions. Um, if I didn't, sorry on the video. They were wanted, really good, too. I just wanted to, make a, wanted to make another esoteric point. Yes, please. Because I, I wrote an interpreter for all this, and I had to do Fantastic, that. yes. Else and ENDIF are not opcodes. Sorry? Else and ENDIF are not really opcodes. They're not opcodes. They are syntactic sugar yeah. uh, that has no function in the language yeah. other than to delink. They're like the curly brackets in C. They don't actually do anything. They just give you the boundaries. They're scope uh, identifiers. They define the scope um, of a function for syntactic purposes. Very good point. Yes, thank you. So with the activation of SegWit, uh, it's clearly shown that Bitcoin's a lot more than money. Yes. Uh, could you talk about that, your opinion? And, and specifically how entrepreneurs are dealing with this, the outside factors. Well, SegWit isn't activated. Um, we'll see. <laughs> um, you may have noticed there's a bit of drama in Bitcoin. <laughs> a bit of drama. Um, so SegWit itself doesn't really change the nature of Bitcoin being able to do a lot more than money. There are other technologies that have redefined it as more than money far long before SegWit. Uh, probably the two most influential were the original implementation of colored coins, which allowed you to give an additional attribute or coloring to a specific value to mean this Satoshi is a share of IBM. This Satoshi is a share of Microsoft, and tradable as such. It's like putting a stamp on a dollar bill and giving it a different meaning. Um, not in exclusion to its original meaning, it's still a Satoshi that's spendable. You just be an idiot spend it as a Satoshi when it's worth so much more through its coloring. Uh, colored coins came out in 2013, I want to say, or maybe 2012. Um, huh? 2013, last coin in July. No, before that though, there was the um, EOPBC specification, uh, which I think was even even earlier than that. And the second one is all of the second layers that are um, enabled, either with op return or through hacks like Mastercoin, now named Omni, Counterparty, and all of the other things that can trade assets and give other meanings. I think so. Uh, Bitcoin is a transactional state engine that, among other things, also transmits value. It is a non-Turing complete transactional state engine, as compared to say, Ethereum, which is a fully Turing complete transactional state engine. Um, but it is a transactional state engine, and you can do a lot with an abstract state machine. Yes. Uh, microphone back there, please. What is the best way you found to write scripts and test them, test their redemption conditions? Like, do you just submit them to testnet and try to redeem them? Like um, yes, you run them on testnet because unanticipated things will happen and then you'll lose money. Um, one of the things you need to be aware of is all of the things we talked about today, uh, all of them, go inside a pay-to-script hash script. That means they acquire a three address, an address that starts with three, just like multisig. They are part of a pay-to-script hash, which means that the network doesn't see this whole redemption script until you try to redeem it. All you tell it is, here is the fingerprint of what I am going to use later to test redemption of this. And it has to match that fingerprint, but you don't say what it is. Now, the beauty of that is you can give it a fingerprint to a completely shit script, and the network will go, fine, I'll lock up your coins with that. And then you go back to redeem it. You say, here's my fancy redeem script, and it goes, uh, it's invalid. Your coins are lost forever. Yeah, I've had that problem. Right. Um, <laughs> one of the things you have to be aware of when you're doing P2SH, you're not validating the redeem script. So the chances of it being redeemable, you know, kind of 50-50. Or worse. I was um, wondering if there's any better way to test that. <laughs> well, um, there are five or six um, interpreters. So Bitcoin script interpreters. What's where's yours hosted? Not hosted. 
There's four or five that are posted. <laughs> One is called um, Web BTC. It's a it demonstrates the entire function of the stack. You can see things that get popped off step by step. What does the stack look like? What does the script line look like? Similar notation to the one I used. Um, and that, uh, that will do it for you. However, um, it's a simulation. And so a lot of the script interpreters are not faithful to the actual core consensus rules. Which means that if there is a bug, like the check multisig bug that needs, you, you'll read in the fine print at the bottom that it says we don't actually do the the extra pop of an extra value for a check multisig, which is great for troubleshooting your scripts, only they won't work on Bitcoin um, because Bitcoin's consensus rules include all of the bugs. And so, if you don't faithfully replicate the bugs in your script, it won't work. Um, so the interpreter can allow you to experiment for a bit and develop some familiarity. It's more of a learning tool. There is nothing that can test your scripts other than testnet. Uh, testnet is the full consensus rules. That's the only way you can test it. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, do you have examples of the different paths through this in the book that are making use of the stack notation you were using earlier? I don't have the full stack, but for each one of these paths, I show what the unlocking scripts are and walk through the various things, including dropping hints about and explaining. So why is that drop there? So it does a full analysis of this over about uh, three or four pages. That says, okay, so how do you do this one? How do you redeem that one? How do you redeem that one? And also, why is the drop there? What does the two do? How does it work out? So it. It's a similar demonstration to what I did today. Um, although you can't ask the book Q and A, so good thing you came today. Thank you. Hey, Andreas. Hey. Um, quick question. So regarding cryptocurrencies, um, we seem to call everything cryptocurrencies, and clearly it seems, you know, Bitcoin obviously is more than just a currency. Um, what what are your views in the space where there's you know things like Ethereum, there's Eternity. There's a lot of these uh, platforms which are seemingly trying to build these kind of capabilities. Do you view that Bitcoin, you know, in the next four or five years, the, the kind of development that we can see, the kind of creativity that can come from these um, languages, is, is Bitcoin still definitely going to be competitive regarding that space? Yeah, yeah so that's the, that's, the, yeah. that's the $20 billion question, <laughs> to be specific. Um, I think um, having, having worked in programming languages for a long while, and having seen what a creative person can do with very, very little... I'll give you an example. Um, and this is completely irrelevant to cryptocurrencies, but it's a funny story. Um, my first computer um, was a ZX81 Sinclair computer in 1982. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was either that one or the next one, the CX Spectrum. I can't remember which one I did this on. It only had 16 colors. I think the first one only had eight. 16 colors, not 16 bit color. 16 total. <laughs> right? So it had the color perception of a four-year-old. Right? How many colors are there? Well, there's red and green and no pink. <laughs> no pink for you. Which is really funny, because you'd think they'd put pink, or at least something skin tone-ish. I don't want to sound like you know, a white privilege, of course it's pink, but something skin tone-ish. A mocha, to be more inclusive. Something. No. So how do you do video graphics for your games if your characters can only be bright red, bright blue, bright green, white, black? <laughs> kind of difficult. Um, we ended up with a lot of video characters who had yellow skin, hence Homer Simpson. Um, anyway, very long story short, um, I was dissatisfied with the state of affairs. I was offended, so I made it do pink. And the way I made it do pink was I hacked the video codec and I invented interlacing. I was 11. I didn't know what interlacing was. I didn't know it had already been invented, but I figured 
If I spend half the time of the video refresh on the TV showing red, and then during the time I'm drawing the other half of the lines, I show white, and we do it really fast at 30 frames per second, what's going to happen? Pink happened. I did that in assembly, because that's the only way to do it, at 30 frames per second at 11. Um, I did pink. Now, the designers of that system had not anticipated pink. Um, and I did it for a very, very trivial reason. <laughs> right? This was not a multi-million dollar project. Uh, this stuff is money. How much creativity can you get with adult, experienced programmers who actually know what the hell they're doing, motivated by really exciting applications and perhaps funded? Um, do not underestimate the creativity of the human mind and what it can create. Lightning Network is the perfect example. No one saw that coming. Right? And it's ingenious in its simplicity, but also in its depth. It's got a lot of layers to it, and once you start unwrapping, you find more and more. Um, now, there are an entire category of problems that Bitcoin cannot do because it's Turing incomplete. In fact, based on the Turing theorem, there are an infinite number of problems <laughs> that Bitcoin <laughs> cannot do. Um, and there are a finite number of problems that it can do. But there's a very big number in the word finite. Uh, and sometimes when that number is big enough, you can't tell the difference. Right? So here's the interesting thing. We're trying to do scripts. What are scripts? Well, fancy people with VC money call them smart contracts. <laughs> right? As you can see, they're not that smart and they're not that contract either, just scripts. But this is a smart contract for a governance program for a three-person partnership with a recovery plan and a grandfathering plan and key rotation and all kinds of other features, pretty sophisticated. It's a smart contract. It'd be easier to write in Solidity, but you can't write it in Script. And the interesting thing is, what is the class of problems that you can solve in Script that don't actually need the full-blown Ethereum stack? And I would say the answer is probably 80% of the most interesting financial instruments that correspond to trillions of dollars in value transacted every day. So that makes Bitcoin relevant for the long term. And the fundamental reason is because this does it at a much higher level of security than Ethereum, in my opinion, because it's limited. So fewer things can go wrong with this service. Um, that doesn't mean Ethereum isn't useful. I'm a big fan. Just different problem classes. Yes, John. Thanks, Andreas. Nice to see you again. Yeah, likewise. And I guess for everything else, there's rootstock, right? For everything else, there's rootstock. <laughs> um, Let's see. Yeah, my my question was um, so you you mentioned that uh, softworks can only uh, like make the rules narrower. Um, yes. And then you also said softworks can do anything. These seem like contradictory statements. Can you explain? How, how that is. Um, remember that part where I was talking about human ingenuity and surprising outcomes and never bet against the possibility of fitting a very large number in the word finite? Uh, yeah. Um, I'm still shocked at how SegWit was done. I just saw a new proposal for something else today that's a soft fork that was even more shocking than what you can do. I've seen proposals for doing um, soft works that do quite incredible things that I didn't think were possible. Um, I would have put it past it, like expanding the consensus rules in a, in a soft work manner. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe it's a contradiction. Maybe it's not. Is this just because they're they're able to like, repurpose the existing <coughs> opcodes that are in the like base blocks, and then well, and then add some of this data like outside that you know new nodes will be able to interpret. I mean, that's what SegWit does. And the way SegWit works is rather ingenious. It, it creates a structure that simply pushes two numbers on the stack. And what you're left with is a stack with two numbers on it. And what does that stack evaluate to? For every node that's not looking at a script, it doesn't have an op equal, it doesn't have a verify, it doesn't have anything. What's the default thing that happens at the end of a stack? End of a stack, the thing you don't need to say at the end of the stack, because the stack does it for you. Return. Verify. It does a verify for you, effectively. Right? So at the end of the script execution, you get to a state where it just takes what's on the stack and says, 
is this a true value? If it is, we're good. If it's not, halt. Well, the definition of true in Bitcoin is any number that's not zero. So you push two numbers onto the stack and then you terminate. That's true. That's a script that anyone can spend. The concept anyone can spend that's defined in SegWit isn't really a concept. It's just how about we just push two numbers on the stack? Everybody who is implementing SegWit will know what those two numbers mean. They're witness script and a version, and we'll interpret them as a witness script as a version. Anybody else will look at them and go, ah, that kind of looks like a true. We're done here. And, and that's how you do a soft fork. That's pretty ingenious. I, I was surprised when I first saw it. I never thought of just push numbers on the stack and don't put any off scripts in there, and leave the interpretation of that to the nodes that come after. Um, microphone over there. Thank you, I think I uh, just came up with a possibly correct uh, way of explaining how res creating restrictions can lead to less restrictions, like to, mm -hmm. to John's question. And maybe you can uh, let me know if I'm um, making sense or not. So we have an existing consensus in this room that two plus two is equal to four, mm -hmm. but a group of us can look at that statement, two plus two is equal to four, and say, no, two plus two is equal to five. Uh, and by saying, or, or, or you know, that, that's a little bit confusing because the, the symbols two and two are, are the same thing. So let's say two and three is equal to five. We, we can make another group that says two and three is equal to six. Mm -hmm. And the more of us that decide that two and three is equal to six, um, we're kind of like organically growing our little consensus group. And eventually if we get big enough, we've kind of like redefined what three means. But the people who used to look at that same sequence of symbols and say two plus three is equal to five, they can still, they can still compute. They can still say yes, when we add two plus three is equal to five, we get five. We can look at that and we can say, well, we've redefined what three and what five mean, so we get two plus three equals to five, but in our language, five means six or something. Yeah, like you, you can do all kinds of hacks like that. Uh, one of the, so, so there's some interesting plays there in terms of what exactly does consensus mean. Does it simply mean the more nodes that accept it? Um, you know, in, in Galileo's time, consensus briefly was uh, that the Earth is at the center of the universe. And, and most modern history teaches us that that's what people believed at the time. No, they didn't. The ancient Greeks a thousand years before was like, duh, the sun's in the middle. And like, yes, and also the distance between us and the sun is so much, and we got it down to 0.3% accuracy by putting two sticks in the ground and measuring their bloody shadows a thousand years before Galileo. Greeks didn't think the Earth was in the center of the universe. That came later. That was a hard fork from reality's consensus. <laughs> Short-lived. We reconverge uh, on the true fork. Uh, but yeah, for short periods of time, you can have weird effects where a whole group of people are persuaded of something that is simply not true, or that is their truth, and they can have their truth. Um, part of the difficulty we have here, and you'll notice this when we're talking about some of the bugs that are in Bitcoin, is that when you redefine things, so that um, okay, previously all. X meant this, but now it actually means you're going to see two more values which define another 150 opcodes. So from now on, don't just interpret this, but interpret the drop after and the number after that as, as not drop, and then take the number, and that's a whole new set of opcodes that means something else. You basically jammed another language, right? In the space of one opcode, you could jam an entire language. Um, that's how Unicode works. That's called keying. Right? You take one element of the language and you say, all of the other numbers mean what you think, except for this one that means look at the next number that comes, and it gives you another 256 possibilities. Bingo, we just upgraded everything. You do that, you keep doing it. What you're adding is layers of interpretation that overload the meaning of the language. And that creates what is affectionately known in programming as CRUD. 
<laughs> and if you allow too much crud to accumulate, you start having side effects, right? Because these things start conflicting with each other, and you have old nodes and new nodes, and they interpret the crud differently, and you create layers. You keep doing that for 20 years. You're like, we still want to be backwards compatible with those guys who are running that little thing back there, and you end up with Windows. <laughs> it's like we are still. You can run Lotus One Two Three from 1987. Fantastic. Yes. But I can't run anything anymore. Because in order to do that, you've layered so much crud in the operating system that doing the simplest thing involves wading through the crud of four decades of crud laying. <laughs> and as a result, everything is slow, inconsistent, buggy, full of, um, full of errors and vulnerabilities. And every now and then you just go, how about we're not able to run that old stuff anymore. Now, the problem with the consensus layer is you can never do that. You can never do. How about we make sure that Satoshi can't spend our coins anymore? I mean, they've been sitting there for so long, and they've been really quiet. Let's disenfranchise them out of a hundred million or billion, whatever it is now, of their coins, like. They have some weird rules back then. How about we just wipe the slate clean and say those are no longer consensus? The side effect will be that anybody who had coins in the first 4,000 blocks can't spend them anymore. Unacceptable right, in Bitcoin. That is the difference between hardware, software, and trustware. We are now quoting trustware. Trustware says you have to carry these consensus rules forever. And you have to make sure that the coins that were redeemable then are still redeemable now. That the blocks that were valid then can still be validated by a node now, which means that you keep laying on the crud. So you're going to have a natural accumulation of crud just to make simple advancements. If you then take that natural accommodation of crud, and to avoid a political debate, you add a whole layer of it voluntarily. Well, now you're just you know, making problems for the future. Right? This is the problem with developing trustware. Bugs become consensus code. Fixes to bugs sometimes introduce more crud than the bug itself, so we don't fix them. We just carry them forward. The cure is worse than the disease. And voluntary introductions of crud into the code will be a burden that we carry forever, because once you put it in and someone writes one UTXO that is redeemable by that crud code, that crud code has to be carried forever, so that that UTXO can be redeemed in the future. Right? And this is the problem with trustware. Now, there is another approach, and that is the approach that Ethereum is exploring. Uh, don't work. Hard fork. Well, then there was that other hard fork. <laughs> and there is a problem in the client now, because we have 19 gigs of hard fork. <laughs> and that is a different strategy. Very effective. I wouldn't bury a UTXO in there for two years. I'd be worried that it wouldn't be redeemable. So there's different strategies to this. We're going to see things that move really fast, things that move really slow. And while you can do tricks like that, you have to consider the future cost. Right? I think uh, should we take more questions or we're done? We're done. I think we're done for now. We have about 15 minutes to mingle. But thank you, Andreas, for your awesome talk.